Campaign modules are books that are entirely self-contained quests and stories for dungeon masters to run for their players. In this video, we'll be going over the 10 deadliest official modules from Wizards of the Coast to let you and your party know what to watch out for if you're thinking about picking up one of these modules. I'll be talking about events that happen in the books to a degree, so be warned that there will be some spoilers ahead. Now let's get started. Starting off our list at number 10, we have the Lost Minds of Pandelver. This is considered the go-to option for both new players and new dungeon masters to learn the game from both sides of the table. The premise of the adventure is simple. There's some crazy stuff going down in some ancient lost mines, and the party has to go there to sort it all out. The adventure is meant for level 1 parties and takes them up to level 5. Because of that, without an immediate means to level up safely, it's actually pretty easy for players to die. The very first encounter is an often lethal ambush by goblins, as if no one spots them then a volley of arrows with advantage during a surprise round could instantly take out at least half the party. There's even a thing in the adventure for DMs where if the goblins do knock the party out, they just loot them and leave them unconscious in the road, but that won't stop players from failing their death saves and a party with no gear is not likely to survive the other encounters waiting for them even if they do survive the ambush. And that's supposed to be a relatively easy first encounter. This is a common scenario throughout D&D. Many enemies are waiting to surprise an unwary party. These fights are a little bad luck away from being death for even the most well-optimized characters, as there's only so much optimization you can do at low levels. Another incredibly deadly encounter midway through the module is when the players should be no higher than level 3, they're likely to run into a young green dragon, a CR8 monster. No level 3 party is rightfully going to be able to take that on, but new players likely aren't going to realize that fact, and if the new players also have a new DM who doesn't have the wisdom to advise them against trying to engage the dragon, this is another encounter that can easily kill the party. I ran into this myself when I ran a module called Humblewood. My players were experienced, but I had them going against a fire elemental boss monster, which they had never experienced before, and they decided to fight it instead of running away, which led to a TPK. So even experienced parties can fall into this trap if it's not a creature they have faced before. Thankfully, once you get past this early and middle part of the game, the final dungeon isn't quite so nasty. While an unprepared level 4 party might struggle with some of the encounters, None of them are as impossible or likely to kill the players as the mini ambushes or the dragon appearances in the early chapters. The Lost Minds is an interesting introductory module that introduces players to one of the core parts of D&D. Low levels are dangerous, so you better be careful. Because of its nature as an introductory adventure, it wouldn't surprise me if the Lost Minds of Vandelver actually has the most player character death of any module. New players in Deadly Encounters can often be a recipe for a party wipe. That said, experienced players with well-built characters are likely to survive the module if they're willing to run from certain encounters, which is why it only comes at number 10 on this list. And at number 9 on this list, we have the Dungeon of the Mad Mage. This is a dungeon crawl style module that covers characters from levels 5 all the way up to level 20 over the course of a 23 floor mega dungeon. There isn't that much plot going on besides the fact that an incredibly powerful wizard named Halister has made this dungeon to test heroes for some unknown reason, due to seemingly insanity as the titular Mad Mage. Each floor is functionally a series of several distinct encounters meant to challenge players at certain levels. Every floor or two, the characters are expected to level up, and likewise, the ensuring floors host stronger challenges. For the most part, the Dungeon of the Mad Mage isn't that difficult. The vast majority of the combat encounters are fairly simple and straightforward. Most of the difficulty in it comes from the fact that there's so many encounters per floor. If players aren't careful and don't rest frequently enough, either through short rest or retreating out of the dungeon for a long rest, they can find themselves in a lot of trouble. Most of the social and trap encounters aren't too dangerous. So, why does it earn a spot on this list? Well, the dungeon is built to work with an experience gaining system for doing encounters. This is to avoid players just rushing through a floor expecting to get a free level by completing it. The problem is, if the players don't go out of the way to completely clear a floor of all threats before proceeding, a number of bad things can happen. The worst case scenario is that players often find themselves underleveled for particular floors having not soaked up enough experience beforehand, and end up taking on encounters far too difficult for them. What might be designed as a somewhat difficult main boss of a floor can suddenly turn into a deadly encounter that players aren't prepared for due to the lack of levels. Furthermore, not clearing out floors means that even players who are wise enough to retreat when they're running too low on resources might stumble into a difficult challenge they didn't previously clear on the way out. Dungeon of the Mad Mage itself is designed to be a medium challenge for your average gaming group, and played correctly, that's what will happen. Played fast and loose though, and players are very likely to find themselves just another in a long line of adventurers who failed to clear the Mad Mage's dungeon. And at number 8 on this list, we have Storm King's Thunder. This adventure stretches from levels 1 up to level 10 and focuses on all the various kinds of giants who are acting contrary to their nature. Something has affected their centuries-long hierarchy, and the players get wrapped up into the problems as ambitious giants start attacking human, dwarf, and elf settlements. Giants, in general, aren't the most deadly class of enemy, but they do have a lot of hit points and hit pretty hard. 
That said, control spells are often quite effective against them, so they are considered to be medium difficulty encounters, assuming there's just one. The challenge with Storm King's Thunder is that, in basically every significant area in the game, there are extremely high number of giants. This creates intended fights that contain multiple giants, and giants get exponentially harder to deal with in numbers. Taking down one or two giants is reasonable, especially with well-chosen spells. And if you want to learn more about spells, we have a top 10 video on them. In this case, I'd recommend checking out the top 10 control spells video I made. But a lot of giants can put out a ton of damage in a short order and have way too many hit points to chew through quickly. So the primary way to get through the module is a lot of stealth and trickery, which isn't always something in abundance in a party. There's a reason that murder hobos became a trope. Traditional spells like Fireball can be useful for some encounters with non-giants, but the powerful air of effect spells are generally at their worst in this module, despite being staples for spellcasters. Because fights are often based around two or three giants, the power of AoE damage is significantly lessened. Even the earlier stages of the game meant to get you up to fifth level before you deal with the giants are a little haphazardly designed and dangerous. The first encounter for level one characters at the start of the module has a lot of potential to be lethal. It's not an ambush like the Lost Minds of Phandelver, but the characters encounter a swarm of 12 goblins and two wargs that have ransacked a town which was partially destroyed by a giant. While the goblins are split up, this is still a serious number of enemies for level 1 party to deal with. Any bad initiative rolls are stepping into the wrong area unwarily, and these goblins can turn any player into a pincushion. That said, the majority of this module's lethality comes from taking challenges head on. That first encounter is there to teach players the best way to handle things in this module, slowly and stealthily. Patient and clever players can pick apart most encounters, even the ones with incredibly high numbers of giants in the area, if they keep their wits about them. Despite their damage output and hit points, giants aren't the nastiest enemies, so Storm King's Thunder tops out the 8th spot on this list. Following that, at number 7 on this list, we have Tales from the Yawning Portal. This isn't like most of the other modules on this list. Instead of a completely self-contained dungeon or ongoing storyline, it's an anthology series of classic smaller modules from D&D's past editions that have been remastered to work with 5th edition. Each small adventure is designed for progressing character levels, meaning you can play the same party through each adventure from levels 1 to levels 12 across the 7 scenarios. The reason this module stands out compared to the other anthology-style modules is two very particular historical meat grinder adventures, White Plume Mountain and the infamously deadly Tomb of Horrors, which was the inspiration for the Tomb of Annihilation module that came out a few months later. In the translation of 5th edition, they have lost some of their lethality, but Tomb of Horrors is still filled with intentionally dangerous and hard to anticipate traps and encounters explicitly designed to kill player characters, even when they're being careful. Even the rewards are lethal, as one of the magic items you get for completing the dungeon has a curse that hits you in the back when you use it in roll 1. White Plume Mountain is less deadly than Tomb of Horrors, but it has its own fair share of absurd encounters, such as a flooded inverse ziggurat filled with a menagerie of dangerous monsters, or a hard-to-avoid trap that ends with players contracting super tetanus. It also has a built-in random encounter system that often makes it impossible for players to even short rest. These two adventures make up the bulk of the player's killing potential in the module, as the other five adventures are largely regarded as having more plot-centric encounters instead of a dungeon filled with life-threatening traps, fights, and puzzles. Though the starter adventure, The Sunless Citadel, does have the classic danger that all modules have as level 1 characters die very easily. If the rest of the adventures were even a tenth as deadly as Tomb of Horrors, then Tales from the Yawning Portal would have made it to a much higher spot. As it stands, it's only about 30% lethal and 70% medium to easy difficulty, keeping it in the bottom half of this list. And at the number 6 spot, we have Descent into Avernus. This is the module designed to take place in levels 1 through 13 as they deal with hell on earth, and eventually hell itself. There's a devilish cult worshipping the Dead Three, causing chaos in Baldur's Gate right after its sister city, Elturel, mysteriously vanished. The players are tasked with figuring out the cult's plans, tracking down whoever is empowering them, and hopefully stop them. Along the way, they find that Elturel was dragged down to the first layer of hell, known as Avernus, due to a deal struck with the archdevil Zariel, a fallen angel and current ruler of Avernus. A lot of the deadliness of this engine Avernus is concentrated on the early game in Baldur's Gate an infamously deadly example in the Dungeon of Death 3, meant for level 2 characters, where the players are expected to deal with several dangerous cultists, one of which can toss out fireballs and this can easily one-shot an entire party of level 2 characters, to the point that many DMs just don't use this ability at all, or tone it down and have them only use a single fireball at most. Which is exactly what I did when I ran this, and while my party did come out bruised, none of them ended up dying thanks to it. Beyond that, there's devils infesting the city that are incredibly difficult for low-level players to handle, as they're usually accompanied by other enemies as well. As the players find out more of what's going on, they can thwart the cult's plans to send Baldur's Gate to Avernus. After that, the players are motivated to investigate what happened to Elturel and manage to find their way into Avernus to attempt to save the city from its fate. Amusingly, most of the encounters, once they get to Hell itself, aren't nearly as bad as the ones in Baldur's Gate. 
And there's some very unique encounter designs, such as a Mad Max style hell vehicle combat, which, while flavorful and cool, aren't particularly lethal challenges. There are still difficult fights in Elturel itself, but the leveling up really tampers most of the difficulty compared to the previous encounters in Baldur's Gate. On top of that, there are stronger potential allies to enlist, such as the magic flying holy elephant named Lulu. As the players unravel the plot, they realize they might want to purify Zariel. In her time here, she has gained powerful enemies amongst both demons and devils, and the players could swiftly find themselves staring down a demon lord or archdevil way outside the capabilities to fight if they aren't careful. Descending to Invernus is more difficult than the average campaign, if only for the several unfair fights early on, and some of the potentially incredibly difficult fights later on in the module. Coming in at number 5, we have Rise of Tiamat. This is the second module of the two-part storyline known as Tyranny of Dragons, and is one of the earliest released adventure modules, even predating Dungeon Master's Guide by about a month. The difficulty in it can be summed up in one word, dragons. Being the second half of an overarching plotline, players are expected to be around 8th level and continue up through level 15 for the finale. At these levels, oftentimes players can come up with incredible combinations of tactics that can let them punch well above their CR rate. But there's only so much you can do at level 8 when one of the first encounters they thrust into you has you likely scoring off with an adult white dragon. Though the quest does let you potentially bypass it if you're clever enough, it doesn't help that the next string of missions are direct encounters with more dragons. The third mission, when players are expected to be around level 10, forces you to directly encounter an adult green dragon, which is still a ridiculously difficult challenge if not played expertly, as it's actively defending the real target of the mission. Even the random encounters during travel involve dragons randomly come out of the sky to attack the players if they've been too successful. Now, Technically, the players can fail these quests, flee from the dragons if the fight seems impossible, and survive to go on to another mission. But every time the player fails, their overall score with the alliance fighting against the evil dragons decreases, and the rewards that help them later on are not available. This includes boons from good dragon allies, or, more importantly, milestones that make the final boss of the campaign, Tiamat herself, weaker when she is inevitably summoned. If the players fail too much before the final encounter, Tiamat will be impossible to beat, even for a level 15 party. The term Death Spiral is used to describe situations where one bad outcome leads into another over and over until you are inevitably doomed, and Rise of Tiamat includes a Death Spiral in the actual overarching narrative and missions. Suffice to say, Rise of Tiamat is incredibly difficult in its encounters, save for the handful of missions that aren't swarming with powerful dragons. If it weren't for the fact that the campaign is strictly for higher level characters who can oftentimes pull amazing feats out of nowhere, it'd likely be even higher on this list. Creeping into the number 4 spot on this list, we have Curse of Strahd. This is a horror-inspired module meant for characters levels 1 through 10, where the players are whisked away into another dimension composed of a small kingdom of Barovia, ruled over by the vampire lord Strahd von Zarovich. Curse of Strahd is one of the most highly touted modules, striking a chord as appropriately challenging for most of its encounters, while being deeply atmospheric and well-written. That said, it's so high on this list for a reason. The opening part of Curse of Strahd is quite aptly named the Death House. In it, it serves as the entry point to the small dungeon for players to experience the atmosphere of Barovia and gain some levels before going out and taking on bigger challenges. Without spoiling too much, the Death House is filled with several deadly encounters with little room to rest in between them, and a final sequence where the only real option for the players is to run or die. Outside of the Death House, Curse of Strahd can easily lead parties to death for one simple reason, there is no set path of encounters for the players. They are more or less free to explore the entirety of Barovia, and because of this, they can easily stumble into encounters that they're not ready for. Almost by design, one of the first encounters players can come across is a windmill harboring multiple night hags when they're only level 3. One of the most common scenarios in Curse of Strahd is a party of level 3 characters running into this encounter, being unable to fight off or appease night hags, and then being stalked by them from the ethereal plane should they not do the night hags bidding. While there are some plot hooks to get them on level appropriate paths, even those have deadly detours into deadly encounters if the players aren't ever vigilant of threats. And one of the most deadly things is the module's design such that the final boss of the entire story, Strahd himself, is meant to interact and meet with the players multiple times over the course of the adventure. While Strahd initially doesn't want to kill the players, preferring to corrupt them instead, many a player has died trying to confront Strahd at too low of a level. And even after leveling up appropriately to take on Strahd, getting to him in his castle is dangerous even for a level 10 party. The danger of Curse of Strahd is a haunting, ever-present one that actually helps sell the horror aspect of the module. Deadly, but for all the right reasons. Slotting in at number 3 in this list, we have Rime of the Frost Maiden. This campaign module focuses on the far north of Faerun. The region is called Icewind Dale, and the main areas of civilization the players interact with are known as the Ten Towns. Ten loosely allied towns that self-govern, but have a united council. The overarching plot is dealing with an evil winter goddess known as Ariel, who is keeping the area in a state of permanent winter. 
The players are tasked to solve this problem through the course of the adventure. Rhyme of the Frostmaid is meant for characters levels 1 to 12, and right off the bat, the first suggested quest puts your level 1 party up against a dangerous, teleporting CR3 bad guy who can one-shot basically any level 1 character with its ice-enhanced attacks. Thankfully, there is an alternate starting quest with no such combat, but it is telling that the first quest offered in the book is incredibly deadly. When I ran this adventure, I ended up killing two of my party of five, one in each of the first two times I encountered him, and I wasn't even using his abilities to the fullest. Frankly, the characters are going to be asked to punch above their weight class for the majority of the module. In the second chapter, where the characters are expected to spend most of their time to level up, there's several random wilderness encounters while the players travel that are almost certainly lethal. The worst being encountered with an ancient white dragon, which will kill the party if it spots them. When I ran this, one of my players managed to bluff the way onto the back of the dragon, but was then stuck on it for a while, and he was one bad roll away from death for a lot of that part. But about half of the random encounters are either highly challenging or incredibly deadly, especially the earlier the player encounters them at low levels. As the players progress past that, before they get to level 7, they're expected to find a way to deal with a CR11 dragon construct that's flying around, uh, trying to destroy some stuff that's a huge spoiler for the module. Well, the deadliness does become slightly less ridiculous in the latter third of the book, as the players will be fairly strong at this point thanks to leveling up. Even this comes with several minor encounters that have a large chance to go badly, such as an ambush by two young Ramarazes and a null vampire. Even in the final chapter where the characters are at their strongest, the ancient city they're forced to explore is filled with over a dozen tough encounters. And if the players ever take time to rest, the big boss of the entire module sends out a small horde after them. If the players survive that, they are immediately treated to a three-stage boss fight where each stage on its own would comprise a tough encounter, much less all three of them back to back. If that wasn't enough, the campaign even has an alternate ending that basically instantly ends the campaign through some weird time travel shenanigans. And yes, my players did get this ending after misinterpreting a prophecy I gave them. But where the time travel would usually end a campaign, I had already built up some time travel stuff with previous adventures with this group of players, so I did give them a path back to the future. For most groups, however, while this ending isn't technically lethal, it is game over. Rhyme of the Frostbane is one of the most consistently difficult modules from start to finish. It only has a handful of truly unfair fights, but the average challenge level is quite high throughout the course of the book. There's so many difficult obstacles at all stages that I've barely skimmed the surface of the difficulty. If your group is looking for a challenge, then I highly recommend this module, as it's personally one of my favorites as well. That brings us to the number two spawn on this list, Horde of the Dragon Queen. This is the first half of the Tyranny of Dragons two-part campaign, alongside its previously mentioned sequel, Rise of Tiamat. It is meant for players starting at level 1 and progressing to level 7, and it is deadly for all of the wrong reasons. You can tell that it was being written at the same time as the core books, as its more slapdash and counter design is a characteristic of earlier books in 5th edition. This adventure was released alongside the player's handbook, and at release, these were the only two books available for 5e, aside from the starter set, which included the Lost Minds of Phandelver. The Monster Manual came out a month after alongside the Rise of Tiamat and the Dungeon Master's Guide a month after that. It was designed with the idea that players would start off significantly stronger than they ended up being by the time the game shipped, and it certainly shows throughout. If the Dungeon Master isn't expressly pulling punches, it's frankly impossible for the players to even survive the first town. They're expected to, at first level, lead assaults on multiple different locations swarmed with cultists and kobolds with no rest in between as the town is ransacked and destroyed around them. Somewhere in the middle of that they get attacked by an adult blue dragon. The dragon doesn't target the players, but if they stand in the wrong spot near the town guards that it is attacking, they will just die to the dragon's breath weapon. If that wasn't bad enough, immediately after this series of absurd encounters, a champion of the cultists, a half-dragon, demands a duel with one of the players or they'll execute innocent captive villagers. A duel the player is supposed to lose. Upon defeating the player who accepted the champion, inflicts a failed death save on them and then leaves, but if the party is short on healing, which at this point they likely are, then their only recourse is to make a medicine check or lose the character to this encounter. The best solution to the opening area is just to cower in fear and not interact with any of the events in the module, and that's just the first half of this segment. There's a cave and camp occupied by the cultists, and the players are supposed to go out and deal with it immediately after this, which is really rough. This kind of miscalculated, mishandled design is everywhere in the module. One of the early encounters is famous for having a CR8 assassin pop out of nowhere to fight the players when they're level 3, likely one hit killing all of them. This is because, when designing this encounter, they didn't know how strong the assassin was going to be as the monster manual was still in development when the book was being written. The list of absurdities continues to pile up. There are two different fortresses the players are supposed to storm that they're underleveled for, 
without the dungeon master making every creature in the fortress deaf and dumb. And even then, individual fights include things like two stone giants or a full-on vampire with two vampire spawns against a level 6 or 7 party. The fights are truly unfair, and the early design follies of Wizards of the Coast are on full display in their first adventure. But still, it only takes number two spawn on this list. As the next spawn on this list, it's not just the fights that are unfair. Finally, at number one, we have the Tomb of Annihilation. As the name suggests, this is a spiritual successor to the Tomb of Horrors, and is meant to take characters from levels 1 to level 11. That said, only the second half of the game is a deadly, dangerous filled with traps and nasty fights like its predecessor. Tomb of Annihilation takes the players on a quest to find the tomb, known as the Tomb of the Nine Gods in the game, to stop a death curse plaguing the world. And to do so, they must brave deadly jungle, evil cultist temples, overrun ancient cities, and then finally the tomb itself, created by one of the most powerful liches in the multiverse, Aserac, who features prominently on the cover of two books. Tomb of Annihilation is the polar opposite of Horde of the Dragon Queen and why it's so difficult. The danger and difficulty are intentionally created to challenge the player instead of being awkward mistakes. The jungle is a trial and survival in the wilderness as random encounters, resource scarcity, environmental hazards, and dangerous landmarks populate their path. It's dangerous from the beginning, like most modules, but contrary to most modules, the danger only mounts as the players progress in levels instead of getting easier. Once you escape the survival-based dangers of the jungle and enter the second half of the game, the players encounter a spiraling lost city filled with all sorts of threats, including a legendary, magical Tyrannosaurus Rex and an aggressive cult of Yanti, who call the main temple of the lost city their home. To progress, the players are eventually expected to infiltrate the stronghold, as attacking it head-on is almost certain a death sentence. This tests their ability to be political with the treacherous Yanti, and so dissent in their ranks causing a rebellion as this is the player's real victory condition. Survival, exploration, and politics are all difficult tests and challenges for players, but nothing matches the final dungeon, the Tomb of Annihilation itself. The dungeon is so deadly the designers include a specific system to allow players to bring in new characters out of the blue when their characters die, as it's expected not all the original characters who went in will make it all the way through. What's more, the death curse looming over the campaign prevents resurrection spells from working, completely mitigating a lot of the survivability associated with higher level characters. The dungeon also tests players' resource management with their limited spells and abilities, their ingenuity to find rare places where rests are possible, their tactical skills in several difficult fights, and their cunning to solve the many puzzles and complicated features of the dungeon. Finally, the climax of the entire module is a fight against an infant death god created by Aserac himself, that is, the cause of the death curse. An incredibly difficult fight on its own right. If the players are successful in defeating the creature, then Aserac is alerted and immediately appears to investigate the cause of the problem. Smart players might be able to avoid him, but if not, then they're bound to square off against one of the strongest liches in history directly after a difficult boss encounter. Even in victory with the end of the death curse, the party might not make it out alive. Tomb of Annihilation is a famously difficult meat grinder, and both players and dungeon masters alike should go in expecting a need for a few backup characters. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any other modules you think I might have missed that deserve to be on this list, or do you have any ideas for future videos similar to this one? If so, leave those suggestions down in the comments below. 